Hi right, guys, welcome to uh, Wargamer Dad um, and my review series of the Mortal Realms magazine. Um, this week we'll be reviewing issue 25. Um, no models with this one, but we're getting a couple of, uh, of reasonable paints. Um, We've got Agrax Earthshade, which is uh, one of the more solid workhorses of the GW range. Um, that and non-oil tend to be the ones that get used pretty much the most. Um, there are others, um, you know, like, uh, like the Camo Shade and nothing else comes to mind. But there are other... Um, there are other shades available, but yeah, non-oil and Agrax uh, shade are the ones that you use more than pretty much any others, possibly apart from the flesh tones. But even then, with 40k armies and fantasy armies, more and more having helms and things like that, Agrax is your friend. And then you've got Balthazar Gold, which is a very, um, it's a Balthazar Gold, yeah. <sighs> which despite being called, uh, <sighs> Balthazar Gold is actually a very beautiful I'm going to open it to show you the paint very beautiful brown kind of a deep copper colour <sighs> um, not sure why it's called Balthazar Gold <sighs> apart from the fact they were calling everything gold um, this is another one of the colours that very much um, yeah, they, they came out in support of the Stormcast Eternals Along with a lot of other pretty beautiful metallic colours that they've been work that they've been working on for a while. I think at this point GW's metallic range is probably one of the best out there, if not the best. Um, and they've done their best to solve problems like um transparency in metallics. They, you, know, you often got um an issue with metallics is that uh, that they would sparkle a lot, but when they dried you'd notice they were transparent bits in the metallic um, in a similar way to that you get to yellow um, a lot of GW's metallics don't do that as much or in some cases at all <laughs> they've really worked hard and come out with a solid product uh, Balthazar Gold is a base that makes it worth about 255 the shades are about 475 so that's 456 um, 675 7 blah 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 blah, blah, blah. £7.30 in total. So, uh, um, you're paying 69 pence basically for the magazine, which isn't bad for the magazine. And, uh, as I say, you will use all this Agrax Earth Shade, which is why it comes in a larger pack, a uh, larger bottle, pot. And, uh, you'll probably get a good solid use out of the Balthazar Gold. It's a, it's a fantastic colour. Right, so um, this one's coming with another one of these uh, fold-outs. They're quite good. Uh, this one's covering the forces of death, um, including the Gash, Manfred von Karstein, uh, the Bone Reapers, uh, the Master of War, uh, the Night Haunts, um, and the Flesh Eater Courts, which basically cover... <coughs> You got Arkan the Black and Neferita, um, which basically cover the um, the kind of the factions. They don't have all the Mortarks here. Um, they are missing at least one, um, which is Lady Oleander, um, who's the Mortark of the Night Haunts. <coughs> but you have got uh, this guy here, who's a kind of skeletal figure. Um, Apparently called Raikonor, and he wants the most macabre regions of Shayesh. Uh, do, 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 do. <sighs> yeah, it goes on to it, it explains that most serve Lady Olinda. Sorry, I keep thinking about the end. Um, Mortark of Grief, or one of her sub commanders. Um, some possessions follow other masters like Raikonor, Grip, Raikonor, the Grimhaler or Cairn King Angrim. So 
there are, it's giving you an example of multiple commanders within the, within the ranks. Um, the armies of the true undead tend to be led by the other Mortoks, yeah, when I say the true undead, the skeleton and zombies and physical undead, um, which can include zombie ghosts as well, uh, tend to be led by Mortoks such as Manfred von Karstein or Arkham the Black or uh, Neferata. It is worth noting Arkham the Black is probably the closest thing Nagash has. Well, he is Nagash's second in command. <clears throat> but in all fairness, Nagash is a control freak. So even as his second in command, um, and probably the only person Nagash comes close to trusting, he probably still isn't entirely trusted. Um, <clears throat> Nagash is paranoid. He's an incredibly paranoid individual. By, by the standards of any human being, he's mad. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> you know, egomaniacal, paranoid, um, yeah, self-obsessed, um, sociopathic, and so on and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, um, the nearest thing he has to a trusted, um, <clears throat> yeah, a trusted servant is, um, is Arkan the Black who was a follower of Nagash's back from the time he was mortal, so he's probably the first follower of, of Nagash. Uh, Neferata, um, when Nagash was cast out, Neferata, in a separate kingdom, tried to kind of replicate Nagash's work, um, up to and including his elixir, uh, elixir of Immortality. She got it wrong, um, and became the first vampire rather than the first um, completely self-contained immortal. <clears throat> then Nagash came back, she refused to bow the knee and he stomped her and now she serves him. <laughs> um, she's amongst the most powerful and glorious of the soul bloke vampires. She, she is a supreme seducer, <clears throat> um, a manipulator weaving lies, illusions and conspiracies. She serves Nagash as his mortal of blood, using her gift of subterfuge to sow his influence. Um, <clears throat> next we have. Um, <clears throat> who else do we have? <clears throat> We've got um, Orpheon Catacross, who is this big bad Bone Reaper do. Um, different from the other Bone Reapers in that he's a single individual rather than a collection of awesome things. Um, he's the Emperor of the Undying Elite and he goes to war accompanied by his many attendants family. <coughs> and yeah, we're going through the night haunt. Who else have we got? <coughs> We've got a brief description of the Flesh Eater Courts. Um, the Flesh Eater Courts, the insane Flesh Eater Courts, consist of once human cannibals infected by the contagious madness of the Ghoul Kings. They think they serve noble empires, but these ravenous hordes are a mockery of a proper military force. Some of these kingdoms serve the guest by choice, while others are bent to his will by force. <clears throat> As I said before, um, the Flesh Eater Courts at this point seem to be the only thing that's left of Bretonia. Um, they're very, very much about nobility, about honour, about things like that in their own twisted, warped way. And their behaviour is much more like that of Bretonians with there being um, high nobles and low peasants and, you know, not quite that much in between, <clears throat> as opposed to, for example, the empires of man, <clears throat> who had bustling cities and traders and merchants and all kinds of things, as well as having nobles and peasants. Um, so, yeah, it, do, it does, they do seem to be basically what's left of, <clears throat> what's left of Bretonia from the old world. And, oh, Finally, um, we've also got Manfred von Karstein. <clears throat> he's another vampire, but he's significantly younger. Uh, I think uh, <clears throat> he was born in the Empire, um, or at least where the Empire was going to be. I don't know if he was actually at the Empire when he was born. <clears throat> and again, and yeah, his family were promised an elixir of mortality, um, and he drank it and others drank it, um, creating the classic vampires that we tended to see in um, 
old world 40k and very much the bah, 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 I want to drink your blood vampires. Uh, whereas Nefariti is an Egyptian immortal kind of vampire. Um, Manfred von Karstein is, you know, beware yon castle. You know, classic uh, Vlad Tepesh, uh, Tepesh, Tepesh, Vlad the Impaler style vampire. You know, Count Dracula style vampire. Um, Manfred, Manfred von Karstein, sorry, von Karstein is the Mortuck of the night. He serves Nagash not out of loyalty, but because he is bound to Nagash will. Nagash does not trust his scheming Mortuck, but knows that Manfred's martial skill, cunning and mastery of necromancy will be required if he's to dominate the mortal realms. For his part, Manfred has assumed the role of willing servant, waiting for an opportunity to break free of Nagash. Which may well happen. It's worth noting Nagash started beneath somebody else. Um, admittedly, that person didn't have magic powers. But he started beneath his brother, who was the, uh, who was the ruler of, um, of, Nagash, of Nagash's original kingdom. And he worked his way up, um, killing his way past more powerful and more dangerous foes. Um, it's entirely possible that somebody under Nagash could rise up. And certainly it takes up a considerable amount of Nagash's energy, um, watching and waiting for plots and stopping people working against him. But that's what you get when you rule. Yeah, when you don't rule for yourself, you rule by fear and force. <clears throat> that um, that added to his paranoia means that if um, if people aren't plotting against him to begin with, they probably are soon afterwards. Okay, so <clears throat> now onto the magazine. <clears throat> right. Issue one. Um, as always, signed by um, the Mortark of magazines, Ian. <clears throat> um, first page, we're going with, through um, with some more Stormcast Eternal uh, lore here. Uh, A Thousand Storms, part four. <clears throat> um, the forces of chaos have been forced back across the mortal realms, but are by no means defeated. Meanwhile, in the dark realm of death, Nagash's elaborate and malign plans begin to take form. Dun dun dun! So there's that. <sighs> My twitchy is fudged today, guys. Sorry. Um, it goes on to describe background stuff. Um, the Ebon Circle, uh, Lord Relictor, Lord Relictor. Tharnius Shrine Song handpicks a force from, lightning, from the Lightning Hawk Stormhost that have been gravely scarred by their many reforgings. Dubbing his unusual brotherhood the Ebon Circle, Tharnus daubs their shining plate with tar that, and leads them deep into the Silver Tower of the Gaunt Summoner. Each Grim Warrior, each, uh, grim warrior proves their prowess. And, um, sorry. Each Grim Warrior proves anathema to sort to sorceries that might once, sorry, that might have shattered more coherent minds. I'd like a more coherent mind. <sighs> um, as Shine Song had hoped would be the case. Together, they banished countless foes with hammer and blade. So that's an interesting thing. Turns out that the less human they are, um, the harder it is to distract them. Next, we've got the seed shattered. Um, basically, this is following on in the um, standard timeline format. Um, Running with the pack, purity without compromise. Um, and that's cool. There. These pages are really thick sometimes. Um, Lathiel, sorry, Lathiel cleansed. Now is beleaguered by the dreadful war constructs of the clan Skyra. Uh, Sylvan of the Harvest Boon Clans welcome the timely arrival of the Radiant Sons of Sigmar, whose Dracovian guard descend upon the Vale of Lathiriel um, in a gleaming phalanx. A uh, phalanx is just a, like a formation. Uh, sometimes it can be square, sometimes it can be <coughs> triangular. Usually it's locked close together with shields um, and on foot, but apparently this one's a cavalry phalanx. <coughs> um... While he even in defence, the Skaven Arch Warlock Gleed signals an enfilade, enfilade, 
Um, from a line of warp lightning cannons, he thought hidden, but even as he does so, the massive Shadow Lord Celestant Aureus Stardrake, Aureus Stardrake, engulfs the Skaven artillery crews from on high. Well, it's nice to be high. <laughs> and again, you've got some more bits there. Warbring, uh, the Harbingers march out, the Descent of Metos, uh, the Descent of Meteors, even. I don't know, guys, sorry. Um, so that's pretty cool. Now we've got the bit that I've been looking forward to. Magic of the Mortal Realms Part 2. <clears throat> the Light and Grey Magic. Which gives you the Prismatic Palisade and the Umbral Spell Portal. When the Prismatic Palisade is summoned, a crystalline wall shimmers into being so intense that light emanates from it. Oh, yep, that light emanates from it. Oh, so intense is the light that emanates from it. I can't read. That all must avert their gaze or be struck blind. Entire armies can be thus halted in their tracks. <laughs> oh, we've got Umbral Spell Portal. This spell appears to most mortals as little more than a swirl of murky shadow. Only those who possess great arcane power can see through the portal's surface. Surface. Jesus. Into the opening, they can cast their magic, increasing the range of their spells. So that's nifty. You can open up a portal, shoot a lightning bolt, and it will come out somewhere else. <sighs> did they just bring portal guns into Realm of Magic? I think they did. <sighs> it's going on to destroy, uh, describe <sighs> light and grey magic. Um, <sighs> arcane power courses through the mortal realms, and each realm is shaped by its own unique magic. Of all the types of various magic, light and grey are perhaps the most opposed to another. Light magic is the strongest in the realm of Hayesh and concerns illumination, purity, symbolism and learning. It can banish shadow and reveal a hidden truth. Grey magic, meanwhile, is closely linked to the realm of shadow Ulgu, which isn't the realm of death, um, Shayesh. It's a completely different realm. Um... In case you're wondering what colour Shoyesh is, it's Amethyst. <clears throat> Grey magic is kind of like in between, but anyway. <clears throat> uh, where are we? So, where light reveals, shadow obscures. Green magic is found in shadow and mist. A force of misdirection that fuels illusion and lies. It is associated with nightmares, dreams, cunning plans. I've got a cunning plan. And a hidden, where are we? And hidden meanings. I wish I hadn't said cunning plans. To me, it's now going to forever be the Baldrick of magics. <clears throat> and that one. <clears throat> the two realms um, where these opposing forms of magic are strongest are Haish, the realm of light, and Ulgu, the realm of shadow. And they're locked in orbit with each other. Between Haish and Ulgu, uh, yeah, Ulgu, lies a small pocket realm known as Uhul Gaish, or the Hidden Gloaming. This region is on the boundary between light and darkness, and elements of both realms' magic intermingle with each other in the gloomy twilight before darting apart again, repulsed by their contrasting natures. <sighs> so, <clears throat> that's pretty fucking cool. <clears throat> We've got some pictures. Of some weird dragonfly things. <clears throat> Next we've got Jade Magic. Uh, jade Magic is life and is strongest in Giran. Its energies ebb and flow in circles much like the seasons. It is a magic of glow. It is a magic of growth, healing, power and nature. Ariel and the Sylvaneth are masters of this magic using it to maintain their, their sacred groves. Amethyst Magic. Amethyst Magic is the magic of death. Its grim power centred upon death and the ending of things. It hovers over battlefields, cairns and graves, a cold power full of doom and inevitability. Amethyst magic gives rise to the undead and is often harnessed by necromancers in order to bind the dead to their will. <sighs> then we, yeah, we've got things like Endless Life Swarm, which is um, obviously uh, jade magic. 
<clears throat> and again, these magics obviously oppose each other. As an, em uh, an emerald life swarm appears as a cloud of buzzing insect. It is the life-giving energy of Giran given form. The life form seeks out wounded, flowing into damaged tissue, healing muscle and tendons and, s and sealing skin and bone. So that's kind of weird. <clears throat> you know, you've got swarms of insect, which is a bit Nurglish. You can kind of see why Nurgle has his eye on, um, on the realm of Giran in particular. Um, <clears throat> and then we've got Suffocating Grave Tide by drawing on death magic that run, sorry, by drawing on the death magic that runs through the realms. Oh, fuck me. I'm going to start again. By drawing on the death magic that runs through the realms. A wizard can pull souls of the dead to the surface and unleash them upon their foes, etc., etc. Um, next, we've got a picture of Nagash's upside down pyramid, or as we like to refer to it, a D4. <laughs> Probably not. And he goes on to um, discuss the necroquake. Um, because all magics exist in all realms just in lesser forms even in the realm of life people die and there are people living and being born even in the realm of Shaiish um Shais? Shais? so what Nagash tried to do was build a giant pyramid that would pull all the death magic from all the realms and direct it straight into him so he could f everybody up and win <clears throat> thanks to the Skaven and some Stormcast and various other people, it went tits up. Um, it it was still really bad, but it wasn't Nagash ascending to um, top of the chain godhood bad. Um, here we go. The Necroquake had many devastating effects upon the realms. The most obvious effect, however, was the wave of amethyst magic that emanated from Shaish. Um, this wave of death caused the dead to rise from their graves in every one of the mortal realms. In addition, Shaish itself has been forever changed with death magic drawn to the center of the realm, creating the Shayish Nadir. <clears throat> Shayish basically runs backwards. Instead of the death magic being most powerful on the edges, it's most powerful in the middle, um, <clears throat> which is a bit of a problem for people. <clears throat> Next, we've got Nurgle, the god of plagues. Nurgle is the lord of decay. This huge one unleashes famine and disease upon the world. Yeah, that what? Sooner or later, every mortal feels Nurgle's pestilent touch. When crops spoil and wounds fester, the plague runs riot. Prayers are offered to Nurgle, and mortals suffer terrible fates. Maybe need. Anyway, and so on and so forth. Unlike his brother gods, Nurgle is portrayed as kindly and jovial. He is known as Grandfather Nurgle to his many blighted followers. Though he is a god of decay his, and his body is full of disease, Nurgle loves life, uh, be it a crying baby or a bubonic pox. Those who worship Nurgle seek his approval, for he bestows great gifts upon his most loyal followers. Um, yeah, he's kind of the best god to follow. Um, I'm not sure I would follow him. More of a zench man myself, but, you know... Sometimes I change my mind. <clears throat> but um, of all the Chaos Gods, Nurgle's the only one who actually seems to have genuine affection. He loves his rotting diseases and those who carry them. and He, he treats them like adorable little pets. He'd still crush and destroy you on a whim. Um, <clears throat> and he may love a disease that's killing a person more than he loves a person. You never know. But he is one of the few to actually seem to have genuine affection um, and some of the people that have risen to power and demonhood amongst Nurgle's followers have found that they're more likely to be forgiven transgressions, more likely to be brought back and things like that, just because Nurgle has solid favourites. Um, Corn doesn't care who dies um, and leaves it up to your own mortal skill. Um, skill. Zench changes his mind all the time because um, he's a lord of change and Slanesh gets bored. Um, the only person who kind of enjoys living in a rut, or the only person, the only god that enjoys kind of living in a rut and having the same old faces around him is Nurgle. So, you know, he is actually one of the more caring gods, surprisingly. And I kind of like that. It makes him a lot more interesting than just Dave. Um, it goes on to describe how his followers are toughened, 
Now his legions are led by great unclean ones, which are gigantic mounds of rotting flesh. Um, they look a bit like Nurgle. Um, you, you, the, the smallest um, creatures that he controls are Nurglings. Um, and alongside you have the plague bearers and the beasts of Nurgle, <clears throat> which are your various, um, your various demons before you get to his mortal followers. I think I mentioned this before, but most gods originally started with four ranks of demons and each god had four ranks. <clears throat> it's changed since then, but basically the four chaos gods were kind of always a bit equal. It was a common GW thing. You can see it, you can still notice it amongst certain things in the... <laughs> Sorry. They started off with a template and then they keep that template. <clears throat> like uh, <clears throat> Marines and Chaos Marines used to just be light and dark reflections of each other. Imperial Garb were organised in the same way as Marines. Um, with, uh, with the four gods, each of them had four levels of demons. Um, greater demons, which were um, unclean ones for Nurgle, blood letters. Um, yeah, blood letters? Yeah, of corn. Uh, yeah, that's right, isn't it? Bloodless. Yeah, blood letters of corn. Uh, for corn, um, <sighs> Ch the changes of ways um, or greater demons of um, uh, Zench for Lords of Change, that's it, or Lords of Change for Zench, and the Keepers of Secrets for Slanesh. And then again, each one went down either, yeah, the only differences were some had mounts, others didn't. Um, <sighs> but originally, no, originally, they all each had mounts as well, you know, it's like, um. Uh, you had fiends of Slanesh would be ridden, uh, would ride weird little insect arm mounts. Um, Zench had discs, corn had juggernauts, Nurgle had, I think Nurgle had palaquins of Nurgle, which are basically great, uh, which are basically unclean ones carrying people on seats because they couldn't move anymore, which isn't quite the same. Um, and they all had sort of low end creatures as well. Um, Oh no, Nurgle had beasts instead, which didn't actually tend to ride. Um, ouch. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, um, moving on, we've got, um, yeah. it goes on to describe the gifts. Mortals usually turn to Nurgle in desperation, but soon come to appreciate the gifts he bestows. Mortals, mortal bodies bloat and decay, entrails spill from gaping wounds, and yet these disgusting mutations only serve to make Nurgle's followers more resilient. It then covers three of his champions. <laughs> um, Gorax bile bloat. Um, they've caused Nurgle's gifts have caused Gorax to bloat and decay. He is now tougher than ever, and takes great pleasure in spreading disease with his own entrails. Flurg Vlan, no, Fug Vlan, uh, Fug Vlan turned to Nurgle. And illness causes his entire body to swell with infection. His swollen body is now fused to his armor, immune to pain and suffering. That's quite common. That's quite a common theme with Nurgle. You know, you're falling apart, you're rotten, but you don't feel pain, or at least um, you don't feel pain in it beyond the continual pain. What have we got? Gyglax. Gyglax was on the brink of starvation when he offered a prayer to Nurgle. A nest of writhing tentacles replaced his groaning stomach, and he hungers no more. So that's pretty cool. And um, he then goes on to describe the Garden of Nurgle. Um, each chaos god kind of has their own <laughs> crib. Um, some stay the same. Some like Zench is always changing and moving about. Uh, Nurgle's is called the Garden of Nurgle. Look, Ren, it's my magic nose garden. Um, <laughs> Nurgle's own room is a nightmare jungle of pus-filled rivers, bubbling lakes of contagion, foul-smelling foliage and lethal clouds of fungal spores. No living being could hope to survive within the plague god's garden for long. Um, it gives a beautiful description of the garden. Um, you get a good idea of how disgusting it is. Next, we've got the purifying flame. This is about bright wizards. Uh, bright wizards are wizards of fire. Um, They're one of the most uh, straightforward battle wizards um, in that their, their primary purpose is to scream fireball and throw fire at people. 
you know, they are, they're your classic um, artillery style wizard, um, by which I mean, they're the guy that stands on the battlements just shooting damaging spells. You know, um, as we just discussed earlier, light magic may reveal secrets and you might see the enemy's plans. Gray magic may enable you to, may enable you to hide a unit of troops and flank the enemy. But uh, bright magic is just like, boom! Fireball, boom, fireball, spray of flamethrower, bang, fireball, meteorite, boom. Um, not subtle, neither of the wizards that, that do it. It's worth noting, actually, that um, one thing they carried over from fantasy is that wizards of the magical, of the eight magical colours are still affected but emotionally by the colours they wield. They start off being like that. Most bright wizards, even before they become magic, are very fiery, um, very emo very prone to emotional episodes uh, and things like that. And using the fire wizard just ma using the fire magic just makes them worse. Um, you know, grey wizards are often wizards that hide their true intent. Um, you know, that lie as easily as speaking. And grey magic just makes them more secretive and more misdirection, misdirectional. That doesn't actually mean they're evil. Um, grey magic is similar to Gandalf in that he'll say what he needs to say to get something done. It doesn't necessarily mean he'll tell the truth exactly because the truth might be too dangerous. Um, and a bright magician, a bright magician might... Um, might be an engine of destruction, but there's no, um, there's no, sorry, there's no guarantee. Well, he, he's not going to just wantonly destroy things and burn down villages. Although he might be a bit more likely to than other wizards, which has led to inquisitors hunting down. Um, yeah, led to the Inquisition hunting down um, bright wizards in in the in the old world. Warhammer Old World had an Inquisition as well, but they were more like tall hats and shooting people. <clears throat> Where are we going to? Bright wizards are mighty mages who harness the power of flame and fire. <clears throat> um, we've got a nice story here with Valentin Embrath. Um, blowing some shit up, so check that out. <clears throat> and we've got some basic descriptions here. Uh, bright wizards. A bright wizard wields the fires of Akshi with great skill, incinerating their enemies with explosive fireballs, colossal gouts of searing frame. flame. Many of these wizards are referred to as pyromancers because of their affinity to fire, and most of them come from Akshi. Then uh, it discusses arcane towers. <sighs> Whilst there are there is a specific model for arcane towers, it's worth noting that almost no two arcane towers are alike. Each one reflects uh, both the magic and the personality of the wizard that makes it. Um, many wizards work from within a lair or laboratory in which to conduct their arcane experience. Many of these towers are constructed with magical observatories. From these vantage points, the ever-shifting winds of magic can be observed and acted upon. <sighs> Dead walkers. Human zombies are amongst the weakest form of undead. I know we've got dead walkers here. <clears throat> oh yes, whenever am wherever amethyst magic is strong, zombies may rise from the dead to attack the living. <clears throat> they are often raised uh, and used as foot soldiers by more powerful undead monstrosity, uh, monstrosities or by mortal necromancers. Or they just turn up. It is totally, um, it is totally normal in a graveyard, even if it isn't in Shayesh, to walk into it and find that zombies have risen up and have to smash them with hammers to put them back down. That's, uh, that's, that's fairly standard. Next, um, we're using the Agrax Earthshade and the Balthazar Gold on the Sigma Mausoleum. <coughs> you can see there, once it's painted on, it's a bit shinier and a bit golder. Um, still looks a bit more coppery to me, um, but it is a beautiful colour and I don't think you can really go wrong um, with metallics. Um, as always, thin coats and build up is better than thick coats. Um, if you find the metallics are giving you, are looking a little transparent, don't be tempted to put thicker coats on, let it dry, put another coat, <coughs> sorry, 
coat on and then lather, rinse, repeat until you're done. <laughs> it's also showing you um, some good shading techniques. Um, you're covering the metallics, obviously, but also in the tops of the gravestones there, you can see it's putting in shade and you can see down there, it just makes the top of it look a bit darker or look a bit murkier. <clears throat> so that's pretty good. <clears throat> and there's more stuff going on there. <clears throat> Next, wizards. This uh, section explains how models with the wizard keyword act in the hero phase, including instructions for both casting and unbinding spells. Um, some spells stay around forever, others are one-shot deals. With the spells that stay around forever, you might want to unbind them. If there's a fireball just rolling back and forth across the battlefield, doing damage, you might want to consider getting the fudge rid of that. Um, use this page together with the model's war scroll in order to cast and unbind spells. Um, it's quite a bit of uh, reading here. Um, basically, it describes casting spells. A wizard can attempt to cast a spell in his own hero phase. You cannot attempt to cast the same spell more than once in the same turn, even with a different wizard. That's to stop things like casting 60 fireballs and just having them roll around. Um, your opponent can cast the same spell, but you can only access one spell once. Um, it's a balancing thing. If you had so many of, the, of certain spells, they would be broken. Uh, limiting their number allows you to do cool things that are slightly broken without them completely ruining the game. In previous versions, magic has swung from being kind of something that maybe helps to being the ultimate thing in the game, rendering rendering armies almost obsolete, provided you have enough had enough wizards and enough power to do it. Um, and both kind of styles are cool. Having a little bit of help like magic swords and that, so you can stab a vampire is amazing. Having a wizard that is basically a demigod walking on the earth is also fun and amazing as well. Um, and GW at the moment, I think they're trying to strike a balance between that. They still want magic and fantastical things. They just um, also want to be able to stab things. Okay. Um, it goes to how to cast a spell. Um, in order to cast a spell, first say which wizard is attempting to use it. It must be, a, and it must be a spell they know. To cast a spell, roll 2d6. If the total is equal or greater than the casting value of the spell, the spell is successfully cast. <clears throat> if a spell is cast, the opposing player can choose one of their wizards, that has been 30 inches of the caster, <clears throat> to attempt to unbind the spell before its effects are applied. To unbind the spell, roll 2d6. If a spell roll beats the roll used by the caster, and the spell is not successfully cast. Only one attempt can be made to unbind a spell. <clears throat> it doesn't specify whether, you know, but I'd imagine that's one attempt across the entire table to unbind a spell as it's being cast. Um, it hasn't got on to, uh, to continual spells yet. Um, probably cover that later. <clears throat> uh, laws of magic. <clears throat> The spells a wizard knows and the number of spells it can attempt to cast or unbind in a hero phase, in a hero phase, are detailed on the wizard's war scroll. Most wizards know the following arcane, but well, know the following arcane bolt and mystic shield. Arcane bolts uh, has a cast of value five. Pick an enemy within eighteen. The cast of the caster is visible to them. <clears throat> that unit suffers one mortal wound. If the caster casting roll is ten or more, the unit suffers D three mortal wounds. So you can see. They're quite nasty, but they're not the end of the world. Um, then as Mystic Shield, uh, casting value is six. It's successful, pick a friendly unit with an 18 of the caster um, that is visible to them. Reroll save rolls of one, fludge. Reroll save rolls of one for that unit until your next hero phase. It also goes on to describe units of wizards. Uh, wizards are usually filled as a unit consisting of just one model. If a unit of wizards, if a unit with the wizards keyword has more than one model, it counts as a single wizard um, for all rule purposes. You must pick a model from the unit to cast or unbind the spell before you attempt to cast or unbind it. <sighs> um, measure the distance and check visibility using the model you pick, so you've got to pick one guy. 
it then go it then runs a quick playthrough through on binding through mystic shield and through um, units of wizards <sighs> next we have the uh, knight encanter which is the model we got earlier uh, knight encanter is a gifted storm caller able to summon hurricane winds and gales of mystical energy those who ignite the knight encanter's wrath soon find themselves battling against a living tempest with a move of five, five wounds, a three plus save and nine bravery. Uh, she's a fairly solid unit on the battlefield. Um, the Night Encanter is a single model armed with an Encanter staff. Abilities, a Void Storm Scroll. Each Night Encanter bears a scroll infused with potent magic. Once per battle, when the model attempts to unbind a spell, instead of making an unbinding roll, you can say this model is using its Void Storm Scroll. If you do so, the spell is automatically unbound. Do not roll dice. It's a once-off power, but in the wrong situation, the wrong spell can really mess you up. <clears throat> um, so, you, know, you have to declare the use of the spell, um, of the void sc uh, scroll thing. So um, you can't roll dice and then go, oh, actually, I'll use my void scroll. You have to do it before that. Um, but it doesn't say you have to do it before... Um, actually, let's have a look. Unbinding. It doesn't say when you unbind a spell. Um, yeah, it gives the impression that you wait until after the caster has rolled his dice, which makes it doubly powerful because if um, if the caster gets uh, an 11 or 12, which is going to be difficult to beat, you've got to wear around that. Ooh, straight away. <laughs> so that's nifty. Uh, Spirit Flask. The Knight Encanter can smash the, uh, the filled Spirit Flask they carry, causing a deadly explosion of soul energy. Once per day at the start of combat phase, you can say this model will shatter one, two or three Spirit Flasks. Um, if you do so, each unit within three inches of this model suffers one mortal wound for each Spirit Flask that is shattered. Units within three with ten or more suffer D3 mortal wounds for each Spirit Chast the uh, spirit flask that was shattered instead. Allocate the mortal wounds to the mo to this model last of all, allocating them to any other unit. Any sorry, allocating them to any other units that are affected. So you can smash as many as you like. The downside is you take wounds as well. You've got five wounds, so you can do that five times. Um, <clears throat> you know. Total of one wound each round, three wounds, one round, two wounds, another round, whatever you want. Um, magic. This model is a wizard. It can attempt to cast one spell in your hero phase and attempt to unbind one spell in the enemy hero phase. It knows arcane bolt, mystic shield and spirit storm. So that's cool. There used to be um, decks of cards that you got where you could pick which spells you wanted. Um, depending on what you wanted to use at a given battle or which enemy you were facing and things like that. Um, this is better. It makes it a bit more predictable and a bit less completely blow your house down, um, which some of the magic used to be. Um, Spirit Storm is a casting value of 7. If successfully cast, each enemy with an 18 uh, of the caster suffers one, sorry, each enemy unit suffers one mortal wound. In addition, until your next hero phase, subtract one from the run and charge rolls for enemy units while they are within 18 of the caster. So that's pretty cool. Um, the encounter staff, I'll read the um, stats on that. It's a range of two, uh, attack of three, three plus to hit, three plus to wound, and minus one rend, and D3 damage. So that is a total of potentially uh, nine wounds on a, on a model you're facing. I should point out, it's not likely you get nine wins, but it's possible. Um, um, it then goes through to um, describe the Knight Encounter abilities. Um, as we've just gone on, you've got Spirit Flask. Um... Yeah, you've got Voice Storm Scroll. As you see, they've got uh, a six and a five. 
as an example of how you can dispel spirit flask um, as you can see it shows that you've got uh, the briar queen and um Oh no, this is different. I thought it worked. Ignore what I said about um, smashing them. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Once per battle. I missed that bit. You can only smash the flasks once per battle. So you've got one, two or three wounds. But again, the disadvantage is you wound yourself. It also um, points out here clearly that um, he smashes two. Here he's, um, she smashed two other flasks. Uh, the bra queen is within three inch of her. Um, and the Night Quester is, in, is within three inches of her, so they both take damage. And you allocate it to them, then to her. <sighs> and finally, you've got um, the Spirit Storm, where you've got her standing in the middle of a hurricane there. Um, and it's got the two different thing, the two different outcomes. You've got a unit of models where one unit suffers a wound, or you've got uh, an individual model where that individual model suffers one wound. So that works in different ways. Next, we've got the Briar, Queen, the Briar Queen and the Thorns of the Briar Queen. I'll just quickly run through the stats on these ones. Um, wounds 5, move 6, save 4, bravery 10. The Briar Queen also has the uh, Rending Screen, which is a range of 10. 3 attacks, plus 3 to hit, plus 3 to wound, minus 3 rend, and 1 damage. So that's going to be able to do some hurt to most things. Uh, the Briar Whip, which has a range of 3. Uh, one attack, three to hit, three to wound, minus two end and D3 damage. So again, that's going to be likely to cause um, some damage to something, even though it only has one attack. The Briar Queen is, na is a named character uh, that is a single model. She is armed with a rending scream and a Briar Whip. This model can fly. Ethereal, this model can ignore um, positive or negative... Uh, must ignore positive or negative modifiers to save rolls. Magic, the Briar Queen is a wizard. She can attempt to cast one spell in your hero phase and attempt to unbind one spell in the hero phase, in the enemy hero phase. She knows Arcane, Bolt, Mystic Shield and Vortex and Howling Vortex. Um, Howling Vortex, uh, casting value is seven. If successfully cast, pick a point on the batting battlefield within eight inches, sorry, 18 inches of the caster. That is visible to them. Roll 2d6 for each enemy unit within 6 inches of that point. If the roll is greater than the value of the unit's move characteristic, or that roll is double, uh, or that roll is a double, so if you roll double 2 and their move characteristic is 16, you still do this. Um, the unit suffers mortal wound and its move characteristic is halved until the caster's next hero phase. So it's halved throughout its own turn and then goes back at the caster's next hero phase, so you won't get to use it until your subsequent. You, know, you won't get to use it your next turn, you'll get to, you won't get to use your character's movement normally your next turn, you'll only get to use their movement as it was in the subsequent turn after that. Next we've got Thorns of the Briar Queen, which have got one wound, six inches movement, a five plus save and bravery six. Um, you can see where you want the Briar Queen with them. They've got a malignant weapon with range one, attacks two, 4 plus to hit, 4 plus to wound, no random 1 damage, which is reasonably respectable. The Thorns of the Briar Queen is a unit that has 6 models, each armed with a malignant weapon. Uh, Varclav the Cruel, leader of this unit is Varclav the Cruel, add 1 attack to characteristic to Varclav the Cruel's malignant weapon. In addition, this unit has the bravery characteristic of 10 instead of 6, while it includes Varclav the Cruel. So he's somebody you want to kill straight away. Uh, or you want to protect depending on who, whether or not you're playing them. Uh, this unit can fly, ethereal, this unit ignores positive and negative modifiers. Um, grasping chains, um, spectral chains ensnare the victim, rendering them helpless. Uh, you can re-roll wound rolls of one for the for attacks made by this uh, made by this unit, the target an enemy that is within three inches of two or more models from this unit. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and again, we've got the instructions here. Um, on how they work, so that's pretty um, pretty uh, straightforward. Next, we've got a little story here, a bit leading up to the battle, the skirmish at Hallowstone Hold, and we have the battle, the battle. Uh, still using the main battle map. Um, like your battle map, gather your dice, ranges, and tokens. Make sure you have the rules reference sheet one and your war scrolls to hand. Choose who will play the Stormcast and who will play the Neuhorn. Follow the set of instructions below. 
as we can see as per standard we're setting up in our um in our own zones end to end the armies are for the Neuhaunts in the dead corner the Briar Queen, the Thorns, ten Chain Rasps, and nine Grave Wraith Stalker, Stalker, Stalker. In the Lightning Corner, Xandria Surebolt, Azure Bolt, five Sequiturs, and five Castigators. Tuz, tuz. So that's pretty cool. Uh, the setup is players alternating, uh, players alternate setting up units one at a time. <sighs> I think somebody we finished first. Um, Stormcast Eternals must be set up wholly within their territory. Nighthaunt units must be set up wholly within their territory. The printed terrain on the battle mat has no effect on your game. Your models may move and fight as if it were not there. First turn. Nighthaunt player has the first turn in the, fir in the first battle round. Follow the instructions on reference sheet one. <sighs> Sorry. Battle plan A, gear round one to play through the game. Play through the game. Glorious victories. When the game ends, uh, sorry, the game ends when one player has no models left on the battlefield. Um, again, we've got the little guidance where you can go to get more information, where they recommend you go. Um, they're totally right. Go those places and your independent stock is too. Um, next, we have the page that I think a lot of people actually look forward to. Coming to the Mortal Realms, issue 26, Xerite Ruins. Um, you've got some more Xerite Ruins, which... Looks slightly similar to the ones you've had previously, but um, unique in their own way. Um, you then got Discover the Sylvanesh and Movement Tutorial on page 26. <sighs> Haven't we done movement already? <clears throat> then for issue 27, oh, something nice, nice for me. Storm Spires, sorry, Storm Sires, Curse Breakers. <clears throat> so we've got three awesome looking models there. Um, look like they work with the badass babe that we've been using. Um, <sighs> battle games in the Age of Sigma, blah blah blah. Um, it will be covering the Storm Sires Curse Breakers. It's going to have Discover the Ossiarch Bone Reapers. That will be very interesting. The Ossiarch Bone Reapers are the newest faction in the Undead. Um, and they are very, very nasty. <clears throat> um, and then more cool rules. Core rules and war spells. Uh, this drags on a little bit, partially because we had extra stuff, partially because I was a bit tired and I think I had to repeat myself a couple of times. Um, hope you guys enjoyed that and I hope to see you next time.